Mariah Carey's unavoidable during Christmas. So much so that some people hate her song for being played so much. We always hear how successful the song is, but nobody's really answered the question of why her song is so successful in the modern day and how she also used some very shady tactics in order to try and stop other artists from having successful Christmas songs. All I Want For Christmas Is You just dethroned Taylor Swift's song Antihero and went number one on the Billboard Hot 100. Again, this song has been out for 28 years now and is the only Diamond Holiday song. This was the lead single to her fourth album, which was a Christmas album titled Merry Christmas. This wasn't even really supposed to happen as most artists would release Christmas albums when their careers were near the tail end. Her co-writer would say, Back then, you didn't have a lot of artists with Christmas albums. It wasn't a known science at all back then, and there was nobody who did new, big Christmas songs. So we were going to release it as kind of an everyday, hey, you know, we're putting out a Christmas album. No big deal. Mariah Carey's team had to talk her into it, and she eventually agreed, writing and composing the song within 15 minutes. When it was eventually released on October 29th, 1994, it received great praise from critics. The song didn't sound old or new. It sounded like it could be played at any time historically and in the future, as we would eventually find out. The song wouldn't hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart until 2019 though, 25 years after its original release. Part of this is due to Billboard rule changes, which we'll get into right now. It peaked at number six on the Billboard Hot Adult Contemporary chart and number 12 on the Hot 100 Airplay chart for the first week of 1995. It was ineligible for the Billboard Hot 100 overall chart because it was not released in any physical format for consumer purchase. This rule would lapse, and its first appearance on the Hot 100 chart would be five years later, in 2000, when it would peak at number 83. This was also when the first remix came about in Japan, called the So So Deaf version, with Bow Wow and Jermaine Dupri, which would appear on her 2001 Greatest Hits album as a bonus track. It wouldn't chart again on the Hot 100 until 2012, due to some other rules. In 2005, the song would top the Billboard Digital Song Sales charts, but was unable to get on the Billboard Hot 100 because it was considered a recurrent single, so they wouldn't allow it to re-enter the charts. Every December, from 2005 to 2008, the song would top the Billboard Hot 100 recurrence chart. But in 2012, that rule was revised to allow the top 50 songs on the recurrence chart the ability to chart on the Hot 100. This led to Mariah Carey re-entering the chart at number 29 and peaking at number 21 in January of 2013. What's interesting to note is the chart positions for the next couple of years. You would think that the song is continually getting more popular, therefore, it should continue to rise in chart position correct? Well, that wasn't quite the case. In 2013, it would peak at number 26 on the Hot 100 charts, five positions lower than the previous year. In 2014, it would fall once again, peaking at number 35 on the Hot 100 charts. I don't believe that the song was getting any less popular. In fact, it was probably getting more popular. There was a remix to the song with Justin Bieber in 2011. It was re-recorded for Mariah Carey's second Christmas album in 2010. So what happened? Well, my belief is that it has to do with consumption of music. When it first came out, it wasn't even available to purchase, which is why it was ineligible for the Hot 100 chart. It was just airplay or radio. Then that rule was changed. The song was also released. So plenty of people bought it. But once you buy a single, you don't buy it again next year unless you lost the CD. You just put the CD in again. So the majority of sales came from radio play. But the industry changed again in the mid 2000s because digital songs became a thing with iTunes. So people once again were buying it. But once they bought it once, they wouldn't have to buy it again to play it. It was in their library. So radio play was able to carry the song. That's why I believe the chart positions kept falling during this time. In 2014, the highest the song would peak would be at number 35. But in 2015, things would change and the song would peak at its highest position on the charts ever at number 11. Then in 2016, it dropped a bit to number 16, but ever since 2016, it would continue to rise. In 2017, it was the first time it ever went in the top 10, peaking at number nine. In 2019, it would peak at number three. And every year since 2019, it has peaked at number one. 
So we have to ask ourselves, what changed between 2015 to 2016 that allowed for this song to rise in not only popularity, but the Hot 100 charts that track radio play, but also sales? My answer for this is the streaming era. Apple Music was introduced to the United States in June of 2015. Spotify was also relatively popular, but Apple Music brought a lot of American consumers into streaming. Coincidentally, that was also the highest charting year up until that point for Mariah Carey's Christmas song. Ever since then, more people have subscribed to streaming services, be it Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, Tidal, or many others, and the music industry's revenues have continued to rise. But the difference between the business models or sales of physical or digital songs and streaming is like I said earlier. The song, if it was bought once, you just played it whenever you wanted to. That includes all of the stores, businesses, families, homes, bars, it's a little bit different because there's certain licenses, clubs, etc. But with streaming services, it's not the same. Every time the song is streamed, it generates revenue. It's a small amount. For example, a single costs about, let's say $1.29 for you to generate a dollar in streaming revenue. The song on average would have to be streamed, let's just say at least a thousand times or more. But everyone is playing this song. Well, every business, year after year, sometimes all day, millions of businesses. As some people have said, she sometimes ruins their Christmas time at work. Retail workers have to hear this song amongst other Christmas songs played nonstop throughout their shift, with one bar owner even putting a rule and cap on Mariah Carey's song, saying, she's the ruler of Christmas and I'm the ruler of this bar. These four walls is mine, baby. If a customer dares play it on the jukebox before December 1st, Bartenders skip the song with the remote. We hear those little twinkles and it's done. After December 1st, the song is only allowed one time a night. Mariah Carey immediately after Halloween, on November 1st, sometime a couple of years ago began announcing with a video and on social media that it was Mariah season and Christmas season for everyone to begin playing her song. Her video is a transition from Halloween and this hadn't been a thing prior to maybe 2018 at the earliest. But she recognized how social media platforms could widen her reach and that songs, with this eventually becoming a meme that everyone expects every year and creates their own version. Mariah Carey's Christmas success has been so big that she's been called the queen of Christmas a couple of times by some people, calls herself that, so much so that she wanted to trademark if all for herself. She filed a petition to trademark the Queen of Christmas in 2021, which means that nobody else would be able to use that title except for her. And if they did, they would be sued. Similar to how Fine Brothers on YouTube attempted to trademark reactions. But this news of Mariah Carey didn't get too popular. Mariah didn't say much, but her and her team did do a lot behind the scenes. An NPR article wrote, her company, Lotion LLC, wanted to use that branding as well as the terms Princess Christmas and QOC, Queen of Christmas, for a range of products from fragrances and makeup to clothing, jewelry, and dog accessories, according to trademark applications. That effort proved controversial, as at least two other artists known for their seasonal songs publicly took issue with Carrie laying claim to the throne. Darlene Love, who said David Letterman christened her Queen of Christmas nearly three decades ago, and Elizabeth Chan, who describes herself as music's only full-time Christmas singer-songwriter. Elizabeth Chan filed a motion against Mariah Carey's request on the basis that she had been called the Queen of Christmas and already used the branding of Princess of Christmas for her daughter years before Mariah Carey ever did. Eventually, Mariah was denied the trademark, which led to celebration by both Darlene and Elizabeth. Thank you, Lord. Congrats to all the other Queen of Christmases around the world, living and whom have passed, said Darlene. And Elizabeth Chan's team would say, Mariah Carey's company was engaged in classic trademark bullying, trying to monopolize the title of Queen of Christmas. It's important to stand up to bullies. That's what we help to do here. Now, because of what Elizabeth did, nobody can claim exclusive and permanent rights to the Queen of Christmas title. There is good reason they were upset. Elizabeth Chan's whole music career, business, and identity is dedicated to Christmas. For her to be unable to call herself Queen of Christmas is taking a massive hit to her entire business. Christmas is just one component of Mariah Carey. She has countless other albums, 
countless other singles and revenue streams outside of Christmas in this song. So many people felt like she was bullying and behaving unethically with greed to try and trademark Queen of Christmas from these other singers who it makes up the bulk of their livelihood. After all, it doesn't harm Mariah Carey if other people call themselves by the same name. She's the most popular one by far. Elizabeth Chen has exclusively only released music and products related to Christmas for the past 10 years, calling herself the Queen of Christmas since 2014, and even called that by The New Yorker in a headline piece in 2018. Before Christmas music, Elizabeth Chen had a normal corporate job, as an executive at Condé Nast. She quit in 2012 and spent nearly two years writing music in preparation for a release independently that was completely self-funded for Christmas 2013 and it would land on the Billboard charts. Since then, she has repeatedly released a new original Christmas album every year and her newest album this year, 12 Months of Christmas, features several songs alluding to the fight for the trademark of Queen of Christmas. This wasn't easy though. In the New Yorker piece, they write how hard she had to work to even get any support. For nearly two years, Chan wrote a Christmas song a day. She recorded 50, paying for studio time and musicians. She sent demos to music producers and to Kelly Clarkson's then record label, No Dice. Her savings dwindled, along with her family's patience. They were like, what are you doing? Chan recalled. Go get a real job. When Chan was on the verge of giving up, a colleague suggested that she put out the songs herself. A $10,000 Kickstarter campaign later, she released an album called Everyday Holidays. The single, Fa La La, landed on the 2013 Billboard chart, right between two songs by Kelly Clarkson. Chan has now released seven albums and had four Billboard hits, including this year's Best Gift Ever, a song she wrote for her husband, which reached the top 10 earlier this month. You would expect of all people, Elizabeth Chan or even Darlene Love from decades ago, to be the one to try and take the trademark like this for themselves. After all, for Elizabeth Chan, it would make perfect sense, since this is her career. A very narrow window of, what, maximum three months of the year that you can earn money? But she never tried to do that. As a matter of fact, Elizabeth would take this victory very humbly, asserting that it wasn't a victory for her, but for everyone else to be able to use that title. Everyone's focused on the win, and very focused on Mariah. But I feel it's really important for people to understand my motivation in this was to really protect and save Christmas for generations after us. I always thought about the future of Christmas music and wanted to protect the genre to allow other artists like me to shepherd in Christmas music without anything in their way. I mean, I was not the one who was trying to stop anybody else. I was just the one that stood up and said, hey, you can't stop anybody else.